Hey everyone, Mark here. Today I'm going to be discussing how to choose a cruise altitude for visual flights in the General Aviation Airplanes and Microsoft Flight Simulator. A few weeks ago, I received a comment from Jacob Blumberg, which made me realize that I've extensively covered every other phase of flight, but I hadn't really done much in terms of cruise, so I'm going to address that now. I'm going to cover how to choose a cruise altitude based on different factors unique to your flight, such as the type of aircraft that you're flying, the weather and wind conditions, and a few other little details too. You'll get the most value from this video if you're already familiar with how to get airborne and how to fly around in flight sim and you're looking to just make your flight a little bit more realistic by cruising at the right altitude, but you'll probably learn a thing or two along the way even if you've got a ton of experience in flight sim as well. Alright, let's get going. A good place to start and probably the biggest factor for selecting your cruise altitude is the airplane that you're flying. Even just within the prop airplanes, there are some that can cruise at much higher altitudes than others, so you need to be aware of those. Rather than look at each airplane individually, what I've done is I've split it up into three categories of general aviation airplanes. I've got the slow props, the fast props, and the turbo props. The slow props includes planes such as the Cessna 152, the 172, the DA-40, all the different variants of the Cub that are available, the Icon A5, and a few more that I'm showing you on screen. For those airplanes, I'll usually choose a cruise altitude somewhere between 3,000 and 8,000 feet based on the factors that we're going to look at in just a second. In the fast props category, I've got the Beechcraft Baron, the Beechcraft Bonanza, and the Diamond DA-62, and with those ones, I'm usually going to choose a cruise altitude of somewhere between 6,000 and 10,000 feet, just because they can get up there a little bit faster than the slower prop planes. Finally, there are the turboprops, so the TBM 930, the Grand Caravan, and the King Air. And for those, I'll usually choose a cruise altitude somewhere between 10,000 and 15,000 feet, because they're much faster airplanes and they have a pressurized cabin. The maximum altitude of all of these airplanes, if you have a look at them, are going to be higher than the ranges that I'm using in this video. But from a practicality point of view, I prefer a slightly lower cruise altitude just because it means I'm going to get there a lot faster. And because I'll be at my cruise speed for a longer time, it means that I'm going to get to my destination a little bit quicker too. The first criteria that I'm going to use for picking my cruise altitude is that in large parts of the world, when you're flying east, you should be flying at an odd thousand number plus 500 feet. And when you're flying west, you should be flying at an even thousand feet plus 500 feet. For example, if I'm flying from LA to Vegas, I might cruise at 7,500 feet or 9,500 feet if I'm flying a fast prop plane. But on the other hand, if I'm flying from Vegas back to LA, I'd probably cruise at either 6,500 or 8,500 since that's going to be an even thousand. All right, so now that I've got the altitude range down to a few choices that I might use, I'm going to hone in on a more specific number by looking at a few other criteria. The next biggest thing to look at is probably the clouds, because you have to keep in mind that when you're flying with visual conditions, you have to keep a certain minimum clearance from them at all times. If you're flying with a weather preset, you control where the clouds are, so it's not really a problem and you can do whatever makes sense for your flight. With live weather, things are a little bit more complicated. Flight Sim uses the data from Meteo Blue to build the weather that you see in the game, so you can use it before your flight to see what the clouds are doing along your flight path. The weather matches up close enough to what you're going to see in Flight Sim. It's not always going to be an exact match, but my guess is there's still some issues being worked out with the live weather with the data that's being reported from Meteo Blue. Once you're on Meteo Blue, you're going to want to go to the weather maps, and then you're going to click on the METAR on the right hand side, and then choose the Civil option. All the icons that come up are showing whether that area is under visual or instrument conditions and that can already give you a pretty good idea if you're going to have trouble with the clouds for your flight. If it shows IFR anywhere along the flight path, you're probably going to have to wait out the weather or prepare for an IFR flight instead. If it's showing VFR, which is what I'm looking at today in this video, then I start by checking my departure point by clicking on the airport in question and the weather forecast is going to pop up. If the clouds are above the cruise altitude that I'm thinking of using, then they're not going to be a factor for my flight. But if they're right at the cruise altitudes that I'm considering, I'm probably going to have to decide whether I'm going to fly above or below them, depending on how much cloud coverage there is. If the weather report says that there's few or scattered clouds, I can consider flying around them to get above and cruise all the way to my destination at that higher altitude, just staying above the cloud layer. 
I usually check the weather of a few other airports along my route to make sure that the cloud coverage stays the same the whole way to my destination. Like that, I'm going to minimize the chances of getting there and not being able to get below the clouds to get down to the runway because the cloud coverage changed somewhere along the way. There's always the risk that clouds can change when you are in flight as well, and you really can't control that. So if the forecast says that the clouds are going to be increasing, it's probably a good idea to stay below them. As a side note, if you prefer a more visual representation of the weather, you can check out another website, which is metar-tafe.com, which is going to show you graphically what the clouds are doing instead. The weather between Meteo Blue and Metar Tafe seems to be pretty similar from what I've seen, and I use them pretty much interchangeably. The only thing to be careful of with Metar Tafe is that if there's no weather at the airport that you're taking off from, it's actually going to use the closest one to that airport. So you really want to check at the top to see where that weather report is coming from. Now there are rules on how far you have to be from the clouds, both in the horizontal and vertical dimensions. But as a rule of thumb, I like to use a thousand feet above or below a cloud layer and about one nautical mile of distance in front or behind me. The full rules are different depending on what kind of airspace that you're in, but unless you're flying on VATSIM, you don't need to worry about it too much, to be completely honest. I've added a link to a diagram in the show notes that shows you a lot more details about those distances if you're interested, though. Alright, so just to summarize, so far I've gone from a range of about 5,000 feet based on the type of airplane that I'm flying, and I brought that down to two different options based on direction of my flight, and now I've narrowed it down to one based on what the clouds are doing. Next, I'm going to look at another factor that you can use, especially on days when there aren't many clouds at all. Before I move on to that though, I do want to remind you if you get some value from this video to please make sure to hit that like button. And if you haven't subscribed yet, to please consider doing so. I publish a new video every two weeks with tips and tricks for Microsoft Flight Simulator, and your likes and subscribes are what keeps this channel going. The other thing to keep in mind when you're choosing a cruise altitude, especially when clouds aren't a factor, is to have a look at what the winds are doing for the cruise altitudes that you're considering. A tailwind is going to reduce the amount of time it's going to take you to get to your destination airport, and it's possible that higher up you go, the winds might be even more favorable to get you there even faster. If there's a headwind on the other hand, it's actually going to have the opposite effect and slow you down, so you really do need to go and check what's going on with the wind to make the right decision for your flight. You can use the METAR reports from Meteo Blue or METAR TAFE to know what the winds are doing at the surface level, but the moment you get above a few thousand feet, there's a decent chance that the wind direction and speed is going to change. That's where winds aloft charts come into play, but honestly looking at them is a little bit more work than what I'm looking for from my flight sim experience. And from what I could tell, you can't see what winds aloft are on Meteo Blue with a free account, so what I use instead is windy.com. I did some comparisons between real winds aloft charts and what I see on windy.com and what I see in Flight Sim, and while it's not an exact match again, it's close enough that you can use it to have a general idea of what's going to be going on at the cruise altitudes that you're thinking of using. When you go to windy.com, the wind layer is chosen by default and then all you've got to do is click on the map wherever you're interested in seeing what the wind is up to and it's going to show it to you in a little pop-up. It shows you ground level winds by default, but there's a scroll bar at the bottom right that you can just drag up to whatever altitude that you want to check. Using this information, if you notice the wind is blowing unfavorably at a given altitude that you're thinking about, either with a strong headwind or a crosswind, you can probably have a look at different cruise altitudes to see if the conditions are a little bit better. The only thing to keep in mind is that if there are different wind layers going in different directions, as you climb through them, it can get pretty bumpy crossing through the layers, especially in a smaller plane. At least in Flight Sim, you don't need to worry about air sickness. On a similar note, another thing that you need to keep in mind when you are flying is that you have to check the maximum elevation along your route. For example, if there's a 6,000 foot mountain in the way of your flight path, you're going to have to choose a cruise altitude that's at least 500 to 1,000 feet above, just because any closer and you're going to risk running into some pretty strong updrafts and downdrafts that will rock you around a fair bit. There's actually a bush trip tutorial that you can do that will actually show you the effects of updrafts and downdrafts, and it's pretty intense. Unfortunately, there is no way to check elevation along your route inside of Flight Sim, so you're going to want to pop over to Sky Vector to check that out. It'll be a lot easier to do it on the website anyways, because you can just input your route and check what the maximum elevation along it is.
And finally, there's airspace problems to keep in mind as well. If you're doing bush flights and you're flying away from all major centers and cities, you can pretty much get away with whatever cruise altitude you want to use. But if you're flying closer to a major town, you're going to run into Class B airspace, which extends from the ground up to 10,000 feet. You can avoid it by staying at a cruise altitude above 10,000 feet, but since most of the GA planes that we're looking at like to cruise at numbers well below that, you're going to need to get a clearance to cross into that airspace, especially if you're flying in a controlled area on VATSIM. You can do the same thing with the built-in ATC and request a Class B transition, but personally I don't like to use it. I find the built-in ATC to be way too incomplete and way too cumbersome, and I just don't use it at all. What I'll do instead is I'll just tune the radio to the right frequency like I'd have to if I were trying to talk to the controllers on that frequency, but I'm just going to make the call out loud to myself instead. I find that actually a little bit more realistic than the way you have to use the menus in Flight Sim, but again, everyone's going to enjoy things slightly different, so feel free to use the ATT if you do like it. With all of that information, you should be able to decide what your cruise altitude needs to be. Hopefully you learned something useful along the way in this video. I really struggled with how to make this video entertaining without it just being me talking all the time. Uh, so let me know in the comments if you have any questions, any follow-ups you'd like to know about. Otherwise, please make sure to hit the like button if you got some value from it. And I'll see you in the next video.